Yeah, when I won my last event, 95 in Rio, I was the uh, oldest guy to win an event when that happened. Uh -huh. And uh, I had an epiphany that night before where, you know, we had been partying. I wasn't really focused on competition at that point in time, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Winning and losing didn't really feel very different. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was at the end of something, mm -hmm. stringing it out. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, when you're not doing your best at something, it doesn't feel good, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, just yeah. half, I'm playing here. Yeah. And so, yeah, that night when I went to bed, the voices in my head had a chat and I adjudicated to have a chat and see what we had to do to achieve what we wanted to achieve together. Mm -hmm. We woke up, you know, I got woken by Tommy Peterson mm -hmm. and I get up, you know, as they go to bed kind of, and Tommy mm -hmm. makes me a couple of Vegemite toast and a cup of tea mm -hmm. and wakes me up going, there's some good lefts out there, BL. And I look and I, all I can see is rights and I'm thinking. <laughs> and so I go down there and I have my quarter and I win. That was Barton Lynch. I'm Jamie Brissick. You're listening to Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More of a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 120 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Barton Lynch is from Australia. He was the 1988 world champion. He won many, many events. He's had a massive career in the surf world, mostly as an athlete, also as a commentator for the WSL, and he is one of the sport's thinking men. I first met Barton in 1984, I think it was. It was his rookie year on tour, and he was an anarchist. He wore head-to-toe black, he had his hair cropped short, and he had very strong views on things. And I was really moved by him. He took himself seriously. And I say that not in a disparaging way, but I'd never ever seen someone have such a high standard for themselves. So we were on tour together, we got to know each other real well. And so I know Barton in sort of two lights. I know of him as the rigorous anarchist, and I know of him as the fun-loving animal. We caught up at his house on the North Shore of Oahu. Barton, 1988 world champion. We traveled on the tour together. When I first met you, you were an anarchist and you had this half moon kind of thing on your board and you listened to Crass and um, Anti-Nowhere League yeah. and uh, we, deep into the punk stuff, black short hair. It was a uh, fantastic tip off to have a moment in time, point the finger at governments, at corporations, at the churches and essentially put a spotlight on institutions of authority that made me view them differently ever since. Yeah. And with a what you would I would consider a critical eye. Yes. <laughs> and um and yeah the music was fantastic. But the concepts of um you know no master, no ruler, in there is no God, you know, which I know is offensive to a lot of people who are strong of religion. I'm not, you know, I don't have um, an opinion or a thought. I'm happy for every individual to walk their path and be them, believe whatever the heck they want, you know what I mean? And yep. that's, that's, I recognise that diversity is, as being healthy. Um, yeah, and so it was, a, I really, yeah, it was... Uh, it's been interesting like to reflect on that and I used to almost like a sport argue religion argue politics <laughs> argue argue capitalism and 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 it's the sort of underbelly of what a free market can happen when people don't have integrity um and so yeah it, it just it, it sort of it did shape my life in a lot of ways and shape the way I thought but as you reflect on it in a broader sense, so did being a goofy footer. Yeah. So did having, you know, growing up, being born in the 60s. Mm -hmm. That energy that surrounded the environment you were born in was the protest movement. Yeah. It was people looking and, and recognising a better way to live their lives. Mm -hmm. and, and it was shut down through war and through fabricated situations to distract people from their cause. 
I once heard that money became really easy to get. And once people took the money, they had mortgages, they were entrenched and had to work. And the thing was killed, mm-hmm. quietened. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know? Yep. Um, being there through the 70s and, and seeing surfing as a counterculture yeah. was what attracted me to it. Me, likewise. Yeah. But what's so interesting, so when I met you, you were just starting on the world tour. I want to say it was maybe 82 or 83. Yeah. You stayed in uh, Los Angeles for a while. Yeah. We hung out. We surfed. And then you went on and you won, I think, your first event in Lacanau, France. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Yeah. yeah. I was staying with Jeff Novak. Yes. And, yes. uh at Manhattan Beach, and you know, it's it's funny. So much of it's <laughs> like a blur. You're like you just go. Oh, it's like another lifetime away. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you look at the tour, it was 15 years of 58. Mm-hmm. It's a small chapter. It is in, in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? Yep. I look at it, and it was everything. But it's really, it's just, it, it, it is a small part. But yeah, they, they, yeah, that's right. And then went to Lacanau, and that was yeah to win an event in your first year felt pretty good you know yeah and then um so we were on the tour together through the latter half of the 80s i think yeah um but thinking about a lot of the ideas ideology that you subscribe to Mm. do you joining the pro ranks were you able was that still in your head at that time when you became a surf star and you were winning events and then winning a 1988 world title i mean was that stuff still fresh in your head or were you more immersed with the kind of the blinders on focused on winning events. No, I, you know what? I've surrendered. <laughs> I've surrendered myself to moments and to ex- other people's um, energy to achieve a goal several times throughout my life. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. at school, you had to kind of play it a certain way to be able to truant as well and as often as I did and get to the beach. Because you knew what your mission was, you didn't feel that you needed to be at school. Yep. It was a waste of time, you yep. know. So I managed that situation in, a, in an incredibly creative and and naughty and clever way. As I reflect on it, and I tell people the story sometimes, and they just trip on 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 you know the, the type of I don't know. Um, I was I had a lot of creative. <laughs> Creative ability, as it turned out. I left school, I thought I was an idiot. To answer your question, though, um, being a punk or having anarchistic, political anarchistic ideals around different ways to create a community, structure and run a community that had different principles as its foundation. It's still something I believe today, you know, the system... The system we live in has evolved a long, long way and we're on the right track as humans. And, they, you know, I don't I don't know people who care who someone sleeps with. I don't know people who care what someone else's religion is. I don't care. I feel like we're really, as a culture, had come a long way mm-hmm. in those years from when I grew up. Um, but the pro-surfer world and those ideas, um, you know, they didn't they, – they weren't very popular. Mm-hmm. They weren't very well understood and they weren't helping my career. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Although it was me and I surrendered that to be a pro surfer. Right. In a lot of ways. I mean, okay, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to play their game. I know what they want to hear. So I tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. You know, and you compromise yourself and your values to achieve the the immediate goal, you know, and that's a, yeah, that, that was what that journey was, and that was a conscious decision. Yeah. It wasn't like I just, you know, went, oh, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to change. I, you know, I've still been mean underneath the, all of that, and I suppose that was taken out or the act, the, the you know, for me always just being a surfer was, I've always said, that's all I am, mate, please. That's not much. You know what I mean? I don't view that as a. Massive contribution to much. But you're always a thinking man among not necessarily a lot of thinking men. So what's interesting is I got to know you just as you were kind of going off on the big odyssey. Yeah. And I really saw that side of you. I remember I remember you were dressed in all black. Yeah. And you really were – you had a lot of opinions and you had a lot to say about everything. <laughs> yeah. And, and, then, and then we were on the tour and, um, and I saw less of that. Yeah. And then later you kind of – you're back there it seems. And so I went on the yeah, – and, you know, the 10 years on the ASP board as a surfers rep arguing with whether they were regional officers or Quicksilver, Rip Curl and Billabong. Um, and through those periods of time there were different sort of ownerships of the sport. So, 
you know, wrestling those guys across a board table to try and get the surfers a fairer percent was where I was playing out my self, mm -hmm. my need almost for, you know, when I see, I don't know, you don't, I don't call it injustice, but I just see those those situations where things are being exploited. Yep. You know, and the surfers, you know, you were there. We were getting exploited, mate. We were getting told what was up. They didn't listen to us. They didn't respect us. And I suppose the first journey of a surfer in creating the sport was to establish that respect. Mm -hmm. And you look to the founding fathers in, you know, Sean Thompson, Mark Richards, Rabbit Bartholomew, Peter Town and Ian Cairns, and, and there was, you know, Michael Ho, so on. But there was these articulate, very, you know, charming, yeah. you know, powerful individuals yes. who were going to create a sport. Yes. And I was sort of tailing in behind that going, I'd be sick if, the, if there was a sport. Yep. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. doing it. Yeah. Let's go. And, and so you watch them materialize it in front of you and you, you know, I've had experiences with Rabbit. I've had experiences with Sean. Um, and beyond all of it, um, I just respect. I know what it must have been like then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was pretty tough when we had to reinvent ourselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? And come off the tour and you had nothing and you're like, oh, shit, I've got to start again. Mm -hmm. What are mm -hmm. we doing? What, how are we going to, wow, you know? So for those guys, that generation before us, it was even more difficult. And theirs was to, when I came in, it was to to create respect for the sport. For sure. And have people respect us. Yeah. And you, to see that being realized is epic. And then to see it get to a point where perhaps the best surfer in the world is earning half a million dollars a month, you know, from, from his array of sponsors mm -hmm. is fucking astonishing. Yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's beyond the dream. Yeah. It's beyond the realities or the potential of us to see into a future and even want that much money. Mm -hmm. So back to the question again. I do have a potential to ramble. Um, yeah, I, you know, there's conscious changes in there and, and playing out that role I had as a surfers rep with the ASP was me fulfilling my need for a little more in my existence, than, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. That 80s boom that we wrote, I, I, um, I always felt this sort of internal struggle. On the one hand, they were the kind of my heroes when I was younger and they were all great characters and they were very countercultural, rebellious. And then there was this sort of athleticism that was, that was kind of newly introduced in the 80s. Yeah. And I always felt, I always joked that I had kind of Iggy Pop riding on one shoulder and Yvonne Lendl on the other. Right, right. And, and I <laughs> didn't quite know what I was supposed to be doing. But when I think, I mean, we were on tour together. We had a lot of moments. We yeah. had, I, I watch you experience great competitive heights and win a world title and win events. Yeah. And I also, we had like raging nights in Spain and yeah. France and stuff like that. Did you feel an inner conflict or were you... I reckon, I reckon I did. And, and, you know, on that, I always had such respect for you, mate. I think we, you know, beyond all of that, what you recognize as you go through life is that we're all energetic beings and the conscious level of existence that they have created for us, it's very freaking shallow. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a very shallow. Look at the education system. Sure. Don't teach about health. Don't teach you about diet. Don't tell it to you about finance. Don't teach you about your own. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's this repetitive memorization of stuff. Yep. You know, like so I look at I, I was fortunate enough, I suppose, to have a perspective and an opinion at a young age. Yeah. That I've questioned my whole life and I question every moment. And in every moment there is doubt. And I'm I've been I teach this thing around confidence that it's a decision. You know, they go, do you have confidence? You don't even have it. I, uh -huh. even, I don't need it. I don't think in terms of confidence. Uh -huh. I'm just doing stuff. Yeah. Whether I'm confident or not. Yep. Does it? It's kind of, that's a, that's a not a, not sort of top of mind. So yep. I feel like somewhere in there as a, as a character through my experiences, through the way I lived, um, that people used to say to me, you know what I mean? And they'd be talking about some incredibly deep subject matter that I would be sitting listening to, and they would look to me and go, "You know what we mean? You know, we know, you know." And I go, "Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah." And I didn't know what they were talking about. Uh -huh. And then in period of time, you go, oh, "I got it. Yeah, that's what they were talking about." Yeah. Um, and so I believe things resonate on a much deeper level, and. You, I've always felt that with you. You know, I was always like, Jay, he's a good bloke, mate. He's uh -huh. got, you know, we yeah. always had that respect. No, we had good times. Yeah, yeah. yeah we had good times. And, yep. Um, and so, I, uh, you know, 
I get into the car and I'll have the kids in the back and suddenly in my head goes, don't crash. You know, the sense coming, don't fall. We need a wind and wave, don't fall. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've got a very active inner voice. Yeah. And I have just learnt to distinguish between myself thinking and myself feeling. Uh-huh. And I ignore myself all day because mm-hmm. this thing has a lot of thought and I recognise that thought as perspective. And it goes to places where if that was me, if I actually was my thoughts, there's moments of extreme thoughts where I go, whoa, yeah. did you just have that one? No, it's amazing how much we can delude ourselves. Sure, huh? and it goes a long way and that's perspective, but I recognise I'm not my thoughts. Yeah. And then I connect with the things that I feel and I make my decisions based on my feelings. Mm-hmm. I don't need to, and this might sound, I don't know, I don't want it to sound cocky, but I don't need to talk to people. Mm-hmm. My wife goes, don't you want to know what the experts think? I go, no. I've got absolutely no interest in what an expert thinks. Mm-hmm. I know what I think. Yeah, It's a constantly evolving, growing, changing, dynamic sphere, but it's me. Uh-huh. And it's based on my my interpretation of stimuli, my existence in my world, and it don't need you know what I mean? So that wasn't always there. Yeah. Do, to do, the do you think, do you, to some degree, do you think you cultivated that from being a, a high level professional athlete? Yeah. hundred yeah. percent I did. Yeah. It's and, a- and from, I cultivated it pri- firstly from getting in and out of four strangers' cars a day mm-hmm. as a young man. Mm-hmm. You know, hitchhiking, Mossman, Manly, Manly, Mossman before school. Yeah. Mossman, Manly, Manly, Mossman after school. And I literally used to get, into four strangers' cars a day. It's so funny you should say that. I did a lot of hitchhiking when I was younger too. And when I lived in Sydney, I did a lot of hitchhiking. And I, at one point, I actually had a car and I would hitchhike just for the adventure. Yes. And I really, I was trying to, I, I wasn't consciously doing this, but I realized now I was really just learning how to talk to anyone. Yeah, And exactly. kind of open to the adventure. But no, that's a, it's a nice thing. And coming from surfing where we can be in a very homogenized world, yeah. it's sort of nice to throw yourself in the car with a stranger and chat for 45 minutes. And, and I used to tell them what I was going to do. Yeah. My name's Bart and I'm going to – and I wanted them to have a good time so that next time they saw me on the side of the road, they'd pick me up. So would you tell them about your pro surfing <laughs> dreams? I was going to be a world champion. Man. No I've had kidding. People, I've had people come up to me since then on a couple of occasions and go, hey, you told me you were going to do that. Wow. Well done, mate. You so, know? And I go, wow, that's powerful. That, no, Thank that's you. so fascinating. So earlier, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But earlier you're saying you, you don't think of yourself as confident, but confident, but to win a world title. Mm. And, and I know as a fellow competitor who never reached the heights that you did, but I had my little moments, yes. and I know about that kind of you're digging into your inner Superman, right? Like mm-hmm. you're, you're just you're doing you're, – you're kind of building – this strength and this um, momentum that's going to ride you to the to the end of the to your dreams to your dreams. Yeah. So talk to me about that because I think I'm always so fascinated by that, and there are not a lot of people who can articulate it well. Mm. Often people who do it well can't articulate it well, but yeah. but you might you might be able to shed some light, Barton. Yeah. Well, you're in. You spend if you spend a lot of time losing. Yeah. There's only ever one winner. And if you're satisfied with less than that and you get to other places and you're satisfied, you may not get to the other end. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because you got a night. Okay, I've got a night's sleep. You know what I mean? Or there's that, there's that personal expectation or that personal content factor that allows you to strive to different places that other people don't. And in that journey of self and trying to find any advantage that you can in any situation, anywhere, I spent my time, I didn't do a push-up, you know what I mean? I didn't do a go to gym. Mm -hmm. I would jump on a – people would come around to do a story, right? they go, and you must train hard as a professional athlete. I'd be, oh, yeah, I train really hard. they go, can we get some footage of your training? So I'd jump on the push bike and ride it for a few hundred metres or jump the pool, swim a lap or two. But I pretty much just surfed. Uh And then I thought in about my mind – and thought about me, and I was imbalanced to the to the cerebral side. Okay, you know what I mean. As yeah. I reflect on me, I was imbalanced because I put all of this emphasis in one area, and I think I, I think I, you know, I freaking have a good understanding of that area, and I'm able to sit there in a WSL commentary booth and feel what's going on, yeah. and know what someone might be about to do because I played with a lot of people in heats throughout my career. Yeah. 
Would do you, was that something that you sort of visualized and manifested when you mm -hmm. were not actually in the water? Was totally. It, yeah. I, well, I got taken to an ashram quite young. Yeah, you know, I suppose twenty, perhaps. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly. Um, well, and I had Peter Druin coach me for a period of yep, time, right? I remember, and yeah. um, Peter Druin lending from method acting, and the concept being that to method act and to let go of yourself completely and be absorbed in a role to the point where others believe you is a fantastic skill. Mm -hmm. So wonder you imagine that and you go, well, you could be anything you want. Yeah. Any day, any time, just, you know what I mean? And there's, so he had me, I remember we were at Bell's Beach in one of them, in Janjak, in one of them little five row cottages that he used to stay in, freezing cold and got the heater on and, and, I've got to be a leopard and I've got to crawl around that floor like a leopard. Nice. And I'm thinking, I feel like a flipping idiot, uh -huh. but I get it. Yeah. And if I can, if I can be the best leopard I can be Yeah. and I can let go of my judgment of self, my, my fear overtaking me and making it unable to even move your limbs, you know what I yep. mean? And just get rid of that and try and be a leopard. Yeah. Um, you're never a good leopard first up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you try and you try and 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 you you slowly through that that journey. Like so, there's been all these. So I went to. I remember going. I can't even remember what it was called. I remember going to some of these groups, consciousness groups, as a young kid, and sitting in on these sessions that were definitely giving you an indication that there's all sorts of things that could be explored here with our potential, with our minds, with our connection to, you know. Um, so, and I remember going to contest sites and just standing there for half an hour and just looking around and looking at everywhere and just doing a full 360 and taking some time and going, well, on top of that thing's got a, well, that's cool. And absorbing myself. I didn't know what I was doing, mm -hmm. really, but I was absorbing myself in the environments. Really interesting. I was taking the time to pay attention to detail uh -huh. and see it and feel it. And I always stayed the next morning, the Monday morning after a Sunday in all of them towns was the best day of the week mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. All of our hula, hoopla, the fanfare was gone. Yeah. And the town had peaked, yeah. popped on the Sunday night yeah. and the winners are announced. And by Monday morning, there was just this lovely hangover, dead calm. I remember that so remember well. That it, was such a, it was such a strange thing because all this momentum would build up for the event through the week. Yeah. The weekend would be huge. Yeah. If you weren't still in the event, you'd be partying and yeah. um, – and the circus would move, leave town and to go the next on to week, elsewhere. Start on a yeah. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. And that's that Monday morning. I love that feeling, eh? Yeah. And sometimes traveling, I'd just have to get a hotel room and just stay there for a day or two and not talk to anyone, answer anything, sleep, watch telly, just uh -huh. have. And I've, I stayed alone a lot. I traveled alone a lot. Uh, you know, my dad died when I was young, and there's some great stories in there around that, but. It kind of, I went off on my mission from that point mm. and I was going to salvage my life mm -hmm. so my mum could look after my brothers, didn't mm -hmm. have to think mm -hmm. about me and I've never, you know, I've been financially independent since I was 11. You're listening to Soundings with Jamie Brissick. This podcast and the Surfer's Journal are made possible due to TSJ's subscribing members and through the sponsorship of Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. To learn more about the Surfer's Journal and its sponsors, or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Now, back to our guest, Barton Lynch. What was your childhood like? Tell, tell, <laughs> so Mossman is a little bit inland from the yeah. Manly, right? So I lived at Whale Beach uh -huh. originally. As I was born in Manly Hospital, 1963. My family live in, on the last house on the northern headland above the wedge at Whale Beach. Okay, great spot. And that's where the baby goes. Wow. And the little baby Barton hangs out in that house for the first three or four years. We're on the cliff, mate. Jeez. We're right on the cliff. And then we moved around down the hill and around the corner to 331, 331 Wild Beach Road, which kind of looked out towards Gosford over the park, um, over Palmy, and we were right above the terrace. You okay. know, the right hand, little right hand? We yeah. were right above that. We, that's where I grew up, right on the ocean there. Hmm. And I'd started, you know, I loved soccer and then found surfing. My dad was the captain of the surf club okay. at Whale Beach. And that was the surf life saving cl culture was a more 
straight English traditional style culture, yeah. lots of beer drinking, yep. no drugs. My dad's a policeman, uh -huh. captain of the club. He's a good, he's a strong character and don't take shit from no one. And, you know, powerful guy in his own right. And they used to have these pillow fights because down the other end of the beach is Tracks mm -hmm. and that at the Wedge is like That's surf right. culture. Yeah, Tracks Magazine, the office. Yeah, They're John right Witzig. There, yeah, and I'll be fell on. on the uh, beach, uh -huh. right? And so I – and I love I love that, eh? I remember this story. My dad, they used to do pillow fights up on top of a pole and the pole would be sort of eight feet off the ground. Uh-huh. Might have been six when I'm a kid. Um, and they, they wrap their legs around it in their Speedos, put one hand down the back of their shorts, grab the pillow and beat the shit out of each other until someone falls off the, <laughs> the, the pole into the sand. My dad loved the ocean. Eh? He loved the beach, mate. That was his answer for everything. Mm -hmm. Go to the beach. Mm -hmm. and Because he'd been grown – he was born in the inner city, became a policeman, worked a pedestrian crossing on a hardware store – and at that hardware store, the people that owned it had a holiday house at Whale Beach. Okay. And they invite my dad, because uh -huh. they see each other every day, they invite my dad down to Whale Beach for a weekend. Uh -huh. He gets to the beach, sees that joint. It's a country town in the early 60s. Yeah. Like it's not even a, yeah. you know what I mean? And he loved it. And they lent my dad the money to buy a house there. And Incredible. And that's how I ended up there. Wow. And so down that other end of the beach, dad starts hitting the guy in the head with the pillow and the pillow fights on. It's aggressive. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I look down the wedge and a guy takes off on one. Yellow board, long blonde hair flowing in the wind, drops down the face, just picks this beautiful line all the way to the beach, steps off onto the sand. I look back to Dad. Dad's bashing the guy with the <laughs> pillow and they're in the <laughs> pillow fight, sweat's flying. I'm thinking, oh, shit. An Afghan gets up, runs down to the guy. He pats the dog. A topless girl sits up off her towel, boobs out, and walks down to him and gives him a kiss and a hug. And they have a little moment. And he, Dad, I look back. Dad's there with a pillow bashing <laughs> the guy, and they're <laughs> smashing each other. And I'm like, wow. And then the guy gives her a kiss and runs off around the rocks back out to get another one at the wedge. Oh wow! And that was the day you knew what you. I wanted. knew which culture I was being a part of, mate. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I knew what I was signing up for. Yeah. And I was looking down, and then you know I would, you know, tracks. I was living in that hippie era. Mm -hmm. Surfing was a, a, a. It was a revolt against the man. Yes. It was, that's what it was culturally. Yes. That's what it was to me. Yeah. And I went, and my dad's a policeman. I'm, the, you know, and he was a wonderful guy, but he was gnarly. He's pretty, you know, old school gnarly. And I just was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a surfer, mate. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the morning my dad dies, he dies in a motorbike accident coming home from work one night. And that day he'd rang my mum and said, hey, we had the best, I had the best day of my life today because he, he, we wow. bought a little tinny, uh -huh. a little boat, a little tinny, you know, a little outboard and went out on the pit water, him and his three boys. He's an orphan, but there he is with his three sons and they're fishing and catching little sharks and on, and then he goes to work and then he's coming home and dies. Wow. And how old are you now? I'm 11. Okay. So he goes to overtake a car that swerves to miss him to avoid a bandicoot and takes my dad out into a tree. Jeez. But there's a whole heap, there's another side to that, which I, is another story, but which is an interesting story in, in terms of my upbringing as well. But then so dad dies, I wake up to my mum's tears and it's, I know the shit's hit the fan. Mm -hmm. I know things ain't ever going to be the same again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And it's, you know, they're, they're, it's gnarly crying and I just roll over. I can't get up. Mm -hmm. I just roll over and go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I had long forte morning thing my whole life. Getting up's always been hard for me. Hmm. Not anymore, mm -hmm. um, but it was always hard. And mm -hmm. it was the infliction of that moment, mate. It was the, the scars of mm. just a deep emotional moment. And my godfather comes in and takes us out onto the veranda and I'm looking over the ocean. He says, your dad, your dad died last night. And I, yeah, I figured pretty much Jeez. You know, as much. And he goes, you know, we have a little chat and he goes, you know, you're the man of the house now. And uh, I shit myself. And he goes, is there anything, you know, what do you want to do? What can I do for you? I said, I want to go for a surf. He took me down to Palmy and dropped me off at Kitty's Corner and I paddle out and surf a few and cry. Wow. Surf a few, cry. And that was my, that was my saviour, mate. Jeez, what an incredible way in. You know what I mean? Wow. From, and I was already surfing, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. and I had that, that moment of seeing that culture and, and that's where I went. I went there for my medicine. I went there for community, I suppose, in that mm -hmm. sense, when I looked at the way they were living. Mm -hmm. And you could see 
back then, even in old Australia, the racist, sexist, arrogant pricks that were running the show mm -hmm. were nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I watched what happened to Aboriginals. I lived with Mick Mock, Chinese guy, mm -hmm. for, de for a decade. Yeah. You know, you just see the racism that Chinese got from those narrow-minded morons too. Mm. So I never felt connected to it mm -hmm. or to them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was always... Mm -hmm. Like I knew there was a better way and I, I just considered that the system was broken from the time European royal families sent their navies and armies out into the, and stole the world, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is what they did. Mm -hmm. That's when it was fair and it's been fucked since then. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and all with, you know, into, you into, into just absolute uh, abhorrent behaviour to steal those places from Indigenous people and the – you know, hundreds and thousands of years of disrespect for those Indigenous people and the way that people have stolen their land and just carried on um, into, you know, the authority figures and even the way the police treated a surfer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, mate. Yeah. So, yeah, I always fall, you know, I've always lent to that side. Mm. I don't, I don't, I don't respect them. I don't really need them. The fact that I live in a culture that encourages me to lie to my child about a fat bloke fucking with reindeers, giving presents to every kid in the world, and instill in, an, in a young child's mind, because, you know, the, the, the real science tells us that before seven years old, you're in an unconscious mind, essentially, right? And what imprints, imprints on you like a, like a tape recorder. You don't have a conscious mind to start taking in information, understanding, and we get imprinted with our behaviour patterns mm -hmm. that largely we spend the rest of our lives trying to find ourselves in and amongst. Mm -hmm. And that's the journey of consciousness, finding yourself in and amongst all of that influence that has happened to you we don't even know. Yeah. When the most important people in your life have lied to you, right? And we've lied to our children about Santa Claus and we've bought their consciousness with presents. We lie to them about the Easter Bunny and we buy their consciousness with sugar and chocolate. We lie to them about the tooth fairy and buy their consciousness with money. Parents, fucking stop it, mate. It annoys me to the bitter core I that it. I live in a community that is that freaking stupid that it lies to its children in their unconscious mind. The most caring, loving people in your existence have lied to you as a behavior pattern and you're already set up to be a muppet for the rest of your existence. I love it, Barton. You, like, you sound like when I met you in 1981 <laughs> or two. It's so great. Sorry, it's that was a tangent. No, oh, it's wonder, no, it's a wonderful but, tangent. Can we swing it back yes, to the 11-year-old kid who's just lost his father? Yeah. And he's um, seeing surfing as a, mean, as a way forward and a means of self-expression. Mm. Describe that kid. Oh, that kid was... Um, I suppose you learn through having to even questions like that make you think about it, don't they? Um, I would. My first instinct is that that kid was pretty skinny, little, kind of scared, kind of intimidated, not physically inclined in terms of fighting and confrontational nature, and so would duck and weave his way around things, learn to use his mouth to get out of situations where others might just throw a punch. From that moment, I was kind of, you know, we're living at Whale Beach, life's simple, idyllic, wonderful, it's safe, it's sound, it's calm. Then I moved to Mossman. Mm -hmm. I walk into the high school. I've never met, I don't know one single human when I walk into that school that day. And that's a, that's a daunting prospect in itself, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there were a lot of those challenging moments, but as I reflect on it, I don't remember it being too big a deal. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It kind of speaks maybe to, to me having more gumption or more courage or strength than I recognised in myself at the time, you know, and you're in, your feel, you're in there thinking all this stuff about yourself, but in another sense you might have been different to what you thought yeah it kind of feels like that a bit yep and did you find uh your solace in the ocean by you know was, was surfing your your place that was that was it was everything to me yeah you know what i mean yeah. i i would uh we would skateboard around our street when we weren't at the beach and then when we went to the beach we would just i'd be there from dawn till dusk hmm. so i was very disciplined in that sense i was a disciplined kid in pursuit of my dream and then you started competing, winning events. You won pro juniors, I think. Yeah, won, won, uh, won both the pro juniors in, well, that same year, really, I suppose, 83. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so so the, the, he goes, okay, he's going to drop the punk thing and I'm going to focus, I'm going to go and play this game properly and if I'm – because I didn't believe in competition. Mm-hmm. I, know, know, I was going to – that yeah. was where I'm kind of going with this. I mean, if I grew up then, I'd be Dave Rastovich today, mate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, you know, I wouldn't – I didn't believe in competition. I didn't – believe in the system, I didn't like having to suck up to the media to create something, but there was no other way to live. I wasn't getting a job. Yeah. I was. I tried jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a brickies labourer. I worked as a tempe. I babysat, did paper runs, did all sorts of, you know, those kind of menial jobs for money. Mm. And um, I wasn't getting a job. I wasn't going into the system and uh, – um, so, so there was no choice. Yeah. Compete or work really was the choice. So I went, okay, if I'm in, I'm in. Mm-hmm. And if these are the rules, these are the rules. Mm-hmm. And if we're going, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not really here to be, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm not, I don't care if I'm liked. I'm doing what we've got to do. Mm-hmm. I'm here to make friends. Mm-hmm. This is a job, mate. This is my future. Yep. Get out of the way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. As you paddle around Ock. Yeah. And I'm sure. looking at you like, and you go, mate, no, I'm, and, you know. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a, but it was a conscious decision. I, and even in my mind, it's just ironic enough too. In my mind, I had that thinking man surfer idea mm-hmm. because I suppose maybe I'd been called or maybe I'd heard it or maybe somewhere in that thing it had resonated with me. And I recognized that perhaps I was the most articulate of our group from all the hitchhiking and all the talking to strangers. And I could sit in a car and talk to someone. I could talk to media and and the sport in that journey for respect, mm-hmm. back to that point, uh-huh. in that journey for respect, they needed me. Mm-hmm. Because when Mark Richards and Sean Thompson and Rabbit weren't there yeah. and their generation was waning and their job was done and they need to talk about a new school and it's Tom Carroll, Tom Mark, Karen, Mark Okalupa and here we are with Barton Lynch, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. what I mean, kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, and, and I had in my head thinking, man, surfer, and I, that's, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then I saw it. On the cover, you know, outside the news agencies, they'd have the bill poster, mm-hmm. have Barton Lynch thinking man surfer. And in my mind, I went, I did that. Nice. I created that, mate. Yeah. And that was one of them early indications into my own power. Mm. Going, hey, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and what I had, you know, I had to learn that dad dying on his, on what was in my perceived recollection of life, um, a day that was great, right? Yeah. I've lived with fear of things getting too good. Mm. I like them good. Mm-hmm. I want them good. Mm-hmm. But I kind of get them to a point and go, okay, it's good. To, no, we don't have to look behind. Oh, shit, it's nearly too good. What's going to happen now? Yeah. You know, and that's what happened in 87 when I lost that world title. That was that kind of a learning was that, you know, and that was my thing. I, I go, I can just keep getting better. Mm. can mm. just keep getting better. And that's a little mantra I have for myself because I recognize that infliction, mm-hmm. you know, from from back then. So you go through life trying to, See yourself, understand yourself, know that you're an idiot, <laughs> you know that, you know, yeah. no, but you're just another ant in the face of a massive universe and uh, and uh, just try and understand yourself and try and, yeah. you know, you don't need other people for that really. Yeah. If you were to reflect on your all your, your career as a professional surfer, world champion, et cetera, is there a moment that stands out that you are kind of most connected, most in the groove, all this? Yeah, when I won my last event, 95 in Rio. Wow, and you would have been in your 30s. Yeah, I was the uh, oldest guy to win an event when that happened. Uh-huh. And it was another one of their moments where, you know, you were the oldest guy to win the QS. Mm. And then a couple of years later, I was the oldest guy to win an event mm-hmm. and go on that kind of lineage upwards that mm. Kelly Slater has sent through the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in his amazing self way. Um yeah, and uh, and and in that one in Rio, I won that event, and uh, I had an epiphany that night before where, you know, we had been partying. I wasn't really focused on competition at that point in time, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Which was, you know, there were le- there's lessons in everything, isn't there? And um, I just said to myself because I knew I was going to party that night, and I had Kelly Slater first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. And at that point in time, winning and losing didn't really feel very different. Mm-hmm. I'd lose heats and not emotionally change at all. Why do you think Completely that is? Completely irrelevant. You just didn't care at that didn't point? Didn't care. Yeah. It was, you know, I'm just, it was just, uh, the, I was satisfied in a way with what I'd achieved um, and I knew I was at the end of something, mm-hmm. stringing it out. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I was partying and most probably, you know, you know, when you're not doing your best at something, 
doesn't feel good, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, just yeah. half, I'm playing here. Yeah, sure. And the new generation's coming in and it's all, yeah. you know, the, the, the momentum generation and we're just these old ones. I'd be like, you know what? Them guys, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I had, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so, yeah, that, I, that night when I went to bed, um, very close to the morning, the voices in my head had a chat and I adjudicated and they agreed to, to have a chat and see what we had to do to achieve what we wanted to achieve together. Mm -hmm. And there was no need for one to ride the other and there, there maybe one needed to have a little more respect for the other and da 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 da, da. And there was this wonderful conversation that I just sat back on and then one had snapped and go, yeah, you know, okay, yeah, easy. I need to bite his head off. Hmm. We're all here. And I'd have a chat to that one, you know. And, mm -hmm. I, and, 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 and we woke up, you know, I got woken by Tommy Peterson. Mm-hmm. I only slept for a couple of hours. Michael Peterson's brother, yep. Shaper. Yeah. Tommy's staying with us, right? Okay. In Rio, uh -huh. in the apartment building with Matt Hoy. And and I get up and, you know, as they go to bed kind of, and Tommy mm -hmm. makes me a couple of Vegemite toasts and a cup of tea mm -hmm. and wakes me up, goes, there's some good lefts out there, BL. And I look and I, all I can see is rights. And I'm thinking, <laughs> and so I go down there and I have my quarter and I win. And by all accounts, I think I comboed him. And I went into the massage table and buried my head into it and just tried to have a little bit of sleep and and didn't even think about Kelly in that. I didn't think oh, – I just had me. Mm -hmm. That's all we had the energy for. That's where the focus had to be. It was a real – and I didn't even look where he was sitting and I think in that power – you know me. I was a competitor, mate. I yeah, knew sure. what, I was playing the game yeah, you were a monster more than I was competitor. surfing. Yeah, sure. And I knew – in my mind, I knew what people were going to do next. I was on that next move ahead of that next move, setting stuff up, you know, mm. really, mm. <laughs> which is wonderful when I think back about it. I go, wow, mate, that was kind of what was going on. Um, and, and so then I had the quarter, and I'm not sure if the quarter, it was Kaipo or Sunny, mm -hmm. and, and not much of my heat stuff I even remember. Mm -hmm. And I remember comboing the quarter, the semo, and in the final. Wow. All three of them. And you were, you were still kind of high from the night before? Or? Well... I was high from the epiphany. Yeah. You know, I was high from the connection to self and for the recognition of a, you are, back to your question about, you know, those voices and that, that insecurities and stuff. And there was a connection made in myself at that point in time where, which is a journey I'd been on in my thinking. Yeah. You know what I mean? And recognizing the thinking and the feeling and the definite and the voice, these different voices in there. And, and so it was a real, it, it did, it, that was a unifying moment in, in, of self and it, it resulted in one of my most fluid performances that was just me. It had nothing to do with them. Incredible. So the, 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 the epiphany, was it, um, was it you sort of talking to your, describe the, I'm listening to two voices have a conversation. And, and what are they saying exactly? Well, they're talking to each other in terms of being a little kinder. Mm being a little more accepting. Mm -hmm. And my, my recognition is, is that, like, I do this. I don't know. Do you know how that happens? You, you're, you're putting your fingers together. How does that happen, mate? Tell me. Yeah. You're not doing that. Are no. you doing anything with that? You just think it, right? Uh -huh. You don't even think it very strongly. Uh -huh. It's not even a strong thought. It's not like, hey, can you move your fingers? Yeah. I just have this little resonant of thought. These two fingers start moving. If I had to control the tendons, the nerves, the muscles, and the whole process of this happening, uh -huh. I wouldn't know where to start. Yeah. This thing is a miracle machine. Yeah. Miracle machine. Yeah, yeah. It's so intelligent. Yeah. It's so smart. Yeah. The, the ability of this to transcend your dreams mm. is what I recognize. I've, I've been sitting there so deep in thought and gone, oh, I'm paddling. Yeah. I didn't put myself down to paddle. Right. And then I've looked up and I'm paddling to a set. Yeah. I don't need to be involved, mate. Yeah. This miracle machine yeah. has done it so many times. Exactly. It's connection to the ocean. I feel like, you know, there's ways when you're a better surfer and ways where you're a worse surfer and you're a different surfer. Yeah. But I feel like my connection at this point in my life to the ocean, to it, to the knowing yeah. And the, the, the relationship has never been better. Yeah, it, it etches itself into oh, you. Oh, and I just feel it, mate. And it yeah. tells me what to do. And even when I have those, you know, those little feelings like I should just paddle two feet that way. Mm. And I don't know why, but I always follow mm -hmm. every day, every every decision, yeah. every movement. Where I come from comes from that connection to my organic deep down self mm -hmm. that is all the experience of my bloodline's experience on the face of the planet in DNA transferred through to me yeah. through freaking thousands of years on a planet billions of years old with intelligence surrounding 
And we watch television. Fuck me. <laughs> Seriously, bro. Seriously, bro. You know what I mean? I love it. And like, so, so you know, I, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm into it. Like, I'm more into those, into surfing, and that's why I like kind of working with people and coaching, and because it's kind of you're helping to evolve their their experience in the planet. Yeah, through surfing. Yeah, and are you still surfing every day? I surf most days. Mm. Um, I've been, I'm involved. You know, I've got to work, and I don't. You know, I'm not retired. I don't not have. You know, what's what's work? Well, work for me is I've always kind of been self-employed. My original idea was that that Duma and I started with when we retired at the end of '97 was a company called the Surfers Group, and the Surfers Group was going to be a boutique-style consultancy because I recognised that consultancy is where people told told you, paid you for what you knew about a subject, and I recognised that I'd been telling people everything I knew forever for nothing because mm. I'm a big mouth and mm. just waffle on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm shutting my mouth and I'm saying another word to anyone until I'm paid. Yeah. And and then we and then the idea was you know through the management of athletes the production of tele we produced sixty two television shows we produced physical events we produced online events I am uh, actively I have my blast off video challenge which is a you know we, that started as a, a Menahuni style event coaching mm. program where I I just did what I thought was going to be a good kind of we don't score a single ride for three days mm-hmm. you know it's a it's an event that has a very different energy yeah and different thing and. And that was bit successful, which is transferred into an online form and into a brand. And so we're kind of we're involved with a video game project that's going to be releasing very soon. I manage and work directly with Vahini Fierro. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, she's my daughter lives on that same island, and we've got a good connection there. So you know, and that's what I know, mate. My life's always look, looked after me. Yeah. You know, and and the, what I've considered the worst moments of my life. Um, and I look at my father dying, mm. but I look at the I suppose the person I've evolved myself to be. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I, I have a, I have a, a, a respect for myself and a, a, a sense of well-being and happiness about myself. You know what I mean? Because I live in my truth. Yeah. I try not to compromise it as often as I can. And like we've talked about, sometimes you do. Mm. And you know, this is this is again to to this moment in time, where people living in their truth, it's not encouraged. It is almost a it's a censorable, a cancelable, a erasable opportunity. If you are yourself, you can be discredited, you can be cancelled, you can be censored, you can be tarnished for life, you can lose all of your connections and you can be disbanded from opportunity because you are different to them. Yeah. Hey, yeah. If you think that's okay, yeah. Right, anyone listening to this thing, if you think that that's okay for one minute, mate, you are the problem, and and that's for me being me in this point in time, mate. No, I, I, I you know, I, I sit like here, it. I sit here, convicted to be me, mm. and I ain't going to be told, mate, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jamie. I'm not going to be told. I'm not going to be coerced. I'm not going to be made. And I look at my children. I'm a grandfather. Look at my grandchildren. And we will make our decisions. You look after your own and we'll look after ours, mate. We're doing all right without you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thanks so much for doing this and it's, it's a joy to hang out with you. My pleasure, mate. Love you. Yeah, love you too, BL. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is written and performed by Paz Lenchanton and Gita Veltistodor. It is produced by Paz Lenchanton and engineered by Samur Kuja. Soundings is brought to you by the Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. The Surfer's Journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you again for listening to Soundings. We'll see you next time.